going to debate, we're, we're going to have a format where first to each uh, contestant, what's the word? <laughs> in the debate? Each debate, debater, debater is it that simple? Yeah. Each debatant will give uh, <laughs> 10 <laughs> minutes, then, then, then they'll each have uh, five minutes to brutally rebut the, the opponent's conclusion. So uh, start with uh, our, our token optimist, Josh Hall. Hi there, thanks. thanks. Yeah, you know, last year, uh, those of you who attended the workshop, uh, I gave a talk, a paper, and, and Hugo gave a talk, and uh, um, Ben stood up, and, and after the, the, the two talks, he says, wow, they really seem to have these totally different um, opinions. So when we were putting the program together, uh, this time we thought it might be even cooler if we made it into a, a formal debate, which, who knows, but um, my, my major point, and, and I call myself a futurist, as, a, as, as a, what I really do in the world. Um, and I've been looking at this sort of thing, AI and nanotechnology and a bunch of other things for, for quite some time, and, and studying history uh, as a way of getting a background on, on, on the sort of things that, that, that you can expect in the future. Um, and my notion of, of what's really likely to happen coming up is something an awful lot like the Industrial Revolution. Um, and uh, it's just the same sort of thing as, as one of uh, Robin's uh, phase shifts in, 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 in growth modes. Um, but a lot of the, the, the basic uh, um, truths remained the same before and after. I mean, people were, people were still people, and, and, and I claim that our, our machines will, in, in some very strong sense, still be people because they'll, they'll be built uh, entirely out of human ideas. Um, and so if we can follow the, the uh, model of the Industrial Revolution, um, what happened actually was that um, after the uh, Industrial Revolution, our, our lives were much better than they were before. If you uh, compare what it was like to be a medieval, medieval serf, um, they have a life, life expectancy of, of something like 30. Um, they, they ate a, a really what we would consider uh, poor, um, bland diet, and one of the reasons they did was that, that they hardly had any teeth left. Um, uh, they hardly ever traveled more than five miles from where they were born, and, and you know, they probably knew somebody who owned a book. I mean, th th this is a very limited kind of life um, that, that was lived by a, a subsistence um, uh, a farmer um, in uh, the place where uh, all of my ancestors came from, anyway. Um, and yet, after the Industrial Revolution um, and the succeeding uh, uh, era of, of, of growth that, that came from that, we get to where we are now. And, um, and we can fly all over the world and, and we talk about crazy things like AGI and, and, um, and, and eat uh, remarkably interesting uh, stuff, if, that, if that's what you like to do. Um, and, and I happen to believe that uh, if we go through another, another revolution like that, um, that uh, the people that will become on the other end of it will look back on us about the same way we would look back on the meaningful surf. Okay, 1900s, 1900, uh, roughly a, uh, um, a century ago, was really a hotbed of technological optimism. Okay, the heroes of the day were things like Thomas Edison. They named cities after him. Edison, New Jersey, still there. Um, Edward Bellamy wrote this book, Looking Backwards, that was a, um, an, an immense popular favorite, that there were something like um, 1,800 um, societies in the various cities of the uh, United States back, in, back around 1900 that were dedicated to advancing um, the kind of future that Edward Bellamy talked about in, in, in Looking Backwards. H.G. Wells um, was one of the a most popular novelist in the world. And, and he was, at least in those days, a, uh, a very optimistic, um, actually socialist, but a very optimistic, um, forward-looking uh, person who thought that we were going to uh, create a whole new world and, and, and with the, the advances of science. With all of this uh, technological optimism, nobody, writing in 1900, nobody predicted that almost everybody would own an automobile. Okay, that, that's, that's sort of the, um, the things that happen when technology takes off and makes 
so much more possible than people are used to believing is possible. Um, and there's lots of people who, who currently look at the automobile and say, you know, what a, what a horrible thing that everybody has automobiles and the roads are crowded and, and so forth. But the fact is that, um, that I would claim that everybody having an automobile is a much better world in which, than one in which nobody had an automobile and only the, 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 the few rich people had uh, cars and, and otherwise everybody was, was dependent on uh, Shanks Mayor mostly. Um, and, and, and of course most of the commerce happened on railroads and so forth. So that, that's another, another historical uh, point to the notion that uh, after a revolution of the kind that we can expect with AGI, um, the world would be a lot better for, for people, individual people to live in. The vast majority of AIs will be human level or lower. I mean, this is just uh, simple economic sense. Um, there's, there's lots and lots and lots of jobs for uh, AIs to do, and the cheaper they are, um, the, the more kinds of jobs you can uh, uh, have you, you in many places in the world they have a doorman who stands there and, and opens the door for you right well you wouldn't think that that people would hire an actual human being to do that but in fact they do the cheaper the human gets uh, the cheaper the human like AI gets the more likely there'll be a doorman at every door okay that, that's the sort of thing you're going to find in the future um, stuff that we would just consider absolutely outrageous conspicuous consumption um, is going to happen because the um, human level effort is going to get cheaper and cheaper. And, and I'm thinking, and I'm talking here about the kinds of things um, that uh, makes the, the, the world safer and cleaner and uh, um, travel easier and um, entertainment better that, uh, that we actually put, put humans to now. But you can imagine um, once the, the, the a human level AI costs a dollar, um, that they'll just be absolutely everywhere, um, and they will be helping you in, in, in ways that you can't imagine being helped before. I mean, uh, just imagine that you were the ruler of the world, and, and, and the efforts of, of all seven billion people were there for, for nothing but your your own personal benefit. Um, the uh, if you if you take the Moore's law worth of uh, um, uh, progress out, you'll get. Um, not too far, uh, maybe 50 years out after, after the first AGIs, you, you'll get to where that, that much human level effort could be uh, redounding to your own benefit. Um, and, and, and if you doubt me, um, imagine how much it would cost to hire um, human accountants to do all the arithmetic that is being done for my benefit by this computer right now. And it, which is probably a billion uh, uh, multiplications per second or, or more. Okay. Um, so the thing is that that if, if if you can think of any way in which having uh, human intellectual physical effort would help you, um, that's going to be possible economically um, after just a few decades of um, the the sort of phase shift in, in productivity that that AGIs are going to make possible. So you're going to be like Bill Gates in this world. Your, your only job in life will really be deciding what it is you want, which is going to be tough because there's going to be an awful lot of possibilities. The resources available to you will be essentially limitless. And um, uh, I mean, if you really want to spend all your time, you know, looking looking over the, the Ben Gertel's uh, uh, neighbor scope at, at what your neighbors are doing, you can do that. But you can also do almost any other thing you want to. Um, Finally, one of the nice things about AGI is that, that in order to make it work, we're going to have to break um, the brittleness of the kind of uh, bureaucratic machines that we build now because the problems with bureaucracies and the problems with, uh, with current symbolic AIs are roughly the same kinds of problems. So I claim that when we get AGI, uh, it will be because we've managed to get beyond this kind of brittleness, um, which means that chances are we'll be able to at least possibly uh, build our social and political structures a little more competently as well. Um, and, and finally, this is just a case of uh, um, cluelessness is, uh, um, is its own uh, um, 
poor reward. Um, whereas if, 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 uh, if companies, um, not to mention governments, were run by ABI, A, AGIs, um, they would do a better job but simply because they were smarter. Okay. Don't hold your breath, but it's conceivable. All right, Dr. Hugo de Garris, explaining why we're all doing. So Josh, Josh took the optimistic view. Uh, I take the pessimistic view. Uh, I live in a country where just a few decades ago about 77 zero million people were killed by the greatest tyrant in history. I'm talking about Mao Zedong. Killed more than Stalin or Hitler. So the Chinese have a living memory of great horror. Uh, the Europeans, the older Europeans, uh, went through the Second World War and bombed and the Blitz and B Belsen and so the city that got bombed flat by Churchill. Dresden, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, um, Americans, uh, you're fortunate. You haven't really had a major catastrophe since the Civil War, and even that was fairly small scale, like half a million or so killed and confined to what, half a dozen states. So I do notice, you know, I've lived in seven countries, I, I sense a, a correlation between new world cultures and a, a greater level of optimism, and old world cultures and a greater level of acceptance of negative scenarios. I, you know, I give this talk in various countries. I, I, well, maybe I'm just kidding myself, but that's, that's what I suspect. Okay, so uh, my, my claim in the debate is that the rise of the massively intelligent machine, I call them artillects, that's artificial intellect, I've been calling them that since the 80s, uh, will be actually catastrophic for human beings in the long term. And by long term, I mean sort of late 21st century. So we're only at the beginning of the century, so we still have a lot of time. Uh, leading to a major war, and the most passionate war that we've ever had, ever. And if you extrapolate up the graph of the number of people killed in major wars, the, the prediction is that uh, it won't be in the millions, it'll be in the billions. So you know, it really is a negative scenario. I hope I'm wrong, obviously, but well, we'll see. Okay. Now, if you believe that artifacts can be, can be programmed or designed, built, so that they remain friendly to us, even as they become hugely more intelligent than us, then there's no debate. I mean, all my scenario becomes moot, right? So uh, I, I better clear that away. Uh, I'm, I'm very cynical of the idea that you can make uh, machines of increasing intelligence above us uh, friendly to us. Uh, my great fear is that once they become so superior to us, they may just look on us as ants. It's just irrelevant. And maybe as a pest. And maybe as a, consciously they wipe us out, or indirectly they do something not caring about us because we're so insignificant. And as a side effect, we just get wiped out. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of risk. It seems to me the key word uh, is, is, is risk. So just, just quickly, a few, a few arguments why I feel that uh, human unfriendly AI is possible. Uh, one's sort of intuitive. If, if you're smarter than the human programmer who put the three laws, if you like, <coughs> as an off type programming into you, if you're smarter than that, what's to stop you just sort of looking at you know, this human level programming saying, God, how stupid. <coughs> Other arguments? Uh, maybe reaching human level intelligence, perhaps, and just a, a maybe, perhaps the only way to do that is to use an evolutionary engineering approach, the, the, the way I do. Uh, how, how does a, a being of a finite intelligence X create a being smarter than it? Well, we do it all the time with our children, in a sense. <clears throat> and we do that by sort of rearranging the chromosomes. So maybe, maybe. Evolution engineering is the only way. But if you do that, it's incredibly complex. How do you understand it when you, when you don't? It's too complex to be understood. But, but it, but it uh, functions anyway. Uh, if you, you know, we'll have full-blown nanotechnology in the next few decades. And so you put a lot of programming in, in a very small space. And along comes a cosmic ray. And, you know. <laughs> so even if hypothetically you could create uh, an ethical intellect, and you had zillions of them. What's to stop this one stray, um, what's the word, aberrant uh, jet lag skin to? 
uh, a cos cosmic raid uh, machine that then behaves uh, like a maverick. Okay. Uh, uh, you're just just being plain wrong. You, you you feel you've made it ethical, but but you're just wrong for some reason or another. Like uh, my background is mathematical physics. In the 30s, John von Neumann so-called proved hidden variable theories are impossible. And then in the 60s, on comes uh, Bell and says uh, von Neumann was wrong. So you know, there's, there's always the oops factor. And if, even if you could, if, if a lot of people felt they really could create justifiably, provably ethical create, creatures, the politicians won't trust them. So you, you still you still have a problem. So. Yeah, the, the politicians typically would take take that view. Okay, uh, this most of you probably know already. <coughs> presented a little bit last year. Uh, these are all the things that I think are coming that will make 21st century artifacts possible. So Moore's law is predicting by about 2020, putting one bit on one atom. So so then what do we do? Femtotech, you know, quark engineering. Or Elementary particle engineering and nuclear engineering. Um, so if, you, if you're putting one bit on one atom, it'll be switching in femtoseconds. That's 10 to the 15 times a second. Um, quantum computing is reversible. So I uh, know heat generated. So you can have three-dimensional circuits of any size. Uh, well, nanotech. Um, perhaps we can grow three-dimensional objects from one-dimensional instructions, a la DNA, and have a kind of artificial embryology, we grow our artificial brains that way. Uh, evolutionary sort of stuff I do, you know, build things by evolving them. Uh, I teach something called topological quantum computing. It's, it's uh, the basic idea is you take uh, a quantum computer, you take the quantum bits and you put them in topological quantum fields. So the topological nature of that field makes those, that information robust so it doesn't get lost, doesn't get disturbed by local disturbances. You go, you get that three more minutes. Oh my god, okay. Be very cute. Yeah, we are going to go faster. Right. Anyway, so our artifacts will be quantum computers. Explosion in neuroscience, we'll have artificial brains, huge industries. Uh, machines are potentially hugely more. You know, Trillions of trillions of times. So, uh, human human brain about 10 to the 16 bits a second. But these nanotech, you know, one bit per atom, quantum computers, whatever, hugely above us. So, so an artifact's potentially vastly superior to to what we are. So then the species dominance debate starts. If everyone has their home robot, and every year or two they change the model and upgrade it. So people will be asking questions like this. You know, could they become smarter, so smarter? You know, should, should there be an upper limit on their intelligence? Um, can, can the rise be stopped? Uh, how, how would we as human beings feel if we became number two? And, and you know, should we build these godlike creatures? So I see humanity splitting three major philosophical groups. The people who want to build them, the people who are against building them, and the people who want to become them themselves, with the various names. And each group has, has a series of philosophical, political arguments. Uh, cosmos, well, the big picture, you know, the universe, right? We, we die out in 80 years, but these creatures would be immortal. It would be almost like a, a religion. Uh, the sense of awe and destiny and energy. And so you, you'd be building gods. Uh, how, do you, how do you stop? I mean, how could it be stopped? It's, it's in our genes, in our nature to strive push and so forth. And the economic momentum would be huge, we're talking trillions of dollars, and the military momentum, the time frame we're talking about, if China doesn't uh, change its government fairly soon, then uh, economic, uh, military, military rivalry between the US and China is worrying. Now the Terrans, they're, they're the people who uh, are opposed to building them, basically their motive is fear. They you know, the, the key word in the species dominance debate is risk. So how can you be sure that these, these creatures one day may decide just to wipe us out? Whatever. So uh, fear of difference when, when the guy next to you is a cyborg and can sort of learn French in a minute. So uh, 
one, one problem I had with Ray Kurzweil, I, I just feel he does he doesn't take sufficiently into account the irrational negative side of human nature. He's just too optimistic. So you don't dis discount this kind of thing. Um, to, a, to a terror and a cyborg and an artillery are not very different. There's so much computing capacity, you say, in a grain of sand. So if you add just like one grain to a human brain, then effectively that human is no longer human. So yeah, one, 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 one more minute to explain why doom is enough. Okay, so the cyborgs, their argument is become gods themselves, and maybe you can avoid the clash between the, the, the groups who want to build and not build them. But I think that the cyborgs, uh, they'll argue, uh, if, if everybody at the same pace become, converts from being human to cyborg, maybe it will work, but obviously that's highly unrealistic. I mean, imagine uh, a mother adds a grain of sand to her baby, newly born baby, and then suddenly the, the baby's no longer human, right? So in a sense, she's killed the baby. Or imagine that you're, I don't know, say your 60s and your adult children decide that they will go cyborg, so, and they're no longer human. So you've lost your children. So you know, there's, there's all kinds of emotional you, you baggage. Can you the wrap up, though? Okay. Uh, you know, all kinds of cultural alienations, everyone's changing and there's nothing assured and, and it's all new. You know, Murphy, there's enormous scope here for Murphy's Law to, to react. Uh, this is not just hypotheses anymore. Kurzweil and I, uh, the, there was a BBC Horizon program uh, two and a half years ago where people actually voted that they prefer the Kurzweil optimistic view or my very pessimistic and here were, here were the results, roughly a third thought a war would come in about two-thirds uh, Kurt's file oh, in the time. How, how might a war heat up? Um, Your time you read, is up. If you can read it, read it quickly. It's time for Josh to rebut him. Okay. Well, and you get a chance to rebut him. <laughs> so I, I see that as the question which will dominate our global politics this century and some references. It, it seems to me that uh, what Hugo is trying to say is that there are going to be people who are so scared of the uh, AIs um, because they believe things like um, the movies of uh, Terminator um, that they're going to go to war with the people who want to build them. Um, and this just strikes me as not being this sort of motivation for major world wars that I've ever seen before. Um, I think the sort of thing that you're going to see much, much more likely is that um, we have all our people in the Department of Defense building uh, AIs and, and uh, uh, artificially intelligent weapon systems, and they're going to be our AIs. And then the, the guys in China are going to build their artificially intelligent weapon systems, and they're going to be their AIs. And if there is a war, it's just going to be the same kind of war we ever ever had before, and it might be a, a worse war or or not, depending on the the, the, the specific exigencies of the of the technology. But it's there's certainly not going to be a war between people who are, are AI proponents and, and people who are um, anti AI. I mean, it, there there are much much stronger emotions aroused on uh, questions like abortion um, that. Uh, that we haven't had any any major wars over, or at least uh, since the religious wars in, in, in Europe in the, in, the, in the medieval period. So um, I think that um, the notion that, that, that this sort of thing, that, that we, that this really small group of, 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 of hyper nerds are, are, are super interested in, is going to uh, massively inflame the population of the world to get into a giga-death war. Um, it is, is a little far-fetched. Um, and I think that the, the, uh, the probability that, that um, uh, we actually do bring some of the, the, uh, the AI software uh, capability of building artificial systems that are less clueless, more responsive, and, and more robust to unexpected changes in its operating parameters uh, is likely to give us better governments um, and hopefully ones that aren't going to 
uh, commit this the, the same sort of uh, genocides on, on their own people that we saw so much of during the, the 20th century. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, right after the, the the previous phase change, we had um, uh, the, the Industrial Revolution. Um, there was the one century out of the out of the five centuries of between 1500 and 2000, the one century that was relatively much more peaceful than the other ones um, was in fact because of the Industrial Revolution. It's called the Pax Britannica, and it was because the British Empire uh, essentially um, uh, had a head of hegemony over the, over the world and, and, and essentially enforced a, uh, a peace, uh, essentially out of a, a, a sense of uh, enlightened self-interest, um, because they, they knew they'd be better off with um, uh, protected sea lanes and, and worldwide commerce. And I, I think that to the extent that, that AIs are really that much smarter than people and, and they really get in charge, um, they're going to do the same sort of thing because war is just bad for business. This is my second book, and it's much more optimistic than the first one. Basically, it's saying, if you, if you look at the rate that countries in the world are democratizing, it's roughly about two per year, then you can predict, and it's, it's almost a straight line, like the vertical axis is the percentage of countries still remaining that are dictatorships versus time. It's, it's almost coming down almost like in a straight line. So you can predict that in about 40 years, there won't be any more dictatorships. Because we'll all be dead. I know. I mean, <laughs> I'm actually, I'm actually in, in, in quite strong agreement with your, what I call, middle term. So, um, in 40 years' time, virtually no dictatorships left. So I coined the word de-dictation, meaning getting rid of dictatorships. Uh, another generalization from political science is that um, democracies do not go to war with each other. So hopefully, 40 odd years, you know, we'll live in a democratic, world and uh, I'm hoping for the creation of global state. So in a sense this comes first and then and then this. This this, this is later in the century, well well into the second half probably. So <coughs> with all this optimism and living with great wealth, uh, a la Bill Gates, all of us, uh, what 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 I find missing in your analysis is the fear factor. I mean, imagine your children, grandchildren, having their home robots and upgrading every two or three years. And they just see, you know, millions if not billions of people will see for themselves the gap, human IQ level gap, and the machine intelligence, that gap closing. And of course, everybody will be asking those kinds of questions. So I, I, I imagine a great debate raging. In fact, we we'll probably get going amongst the populace in a few months. Have you heard that the Ray Kurzweil movie is coming out? Transcendent Man? So I wouldn't be at all surprised you know, that that will help stimulate the debate. So uh, don't, you know, don't underestimate the fear factor, the fear of difference. You know, uh, you know, just just the change, slight change of color of your hair or the angle of your eyes. You know, you know, uh, when I was in Japan, I lived eight years in Japan, I'd sit down and I could just sense the hatred <laughs> of, of these older Japanese. Why? Because my ancestors firebombed them. So they're just minor differences. So, I mean, how are we going to feel when, when these creatures, these, these cyborgs, if you like, part human, part what something else? Uh, well, well I, I don't have to defend this as a hypothesis, right? The, the, the sociologists have already, in a sense, started. Uh, well, you saw the third, two-thirds. I, I invite my audiences when I talk to vote. And it's 60, 40. One, one, one more minute. Okay, it's 60, 40, 40, 60, 50, 50. Seems to be an issue that splits people right down the line. And in fact, I suspect it's within the individual. Because you know, you know, the cosmic picture is magnificent, right? You'd be building gods. But on the other hand, maybe our potential exterminators. It's, it's, it's a really deep issue. So you have two ideologies, very powerful, each in, in, in its own right, bitterly opposed, and hence, hence a major war. You know, we've always had wars. So uh, with late 21st century weaponry, maybe nano-based, 